Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for having me. Um, like Steve said, I'm Helen, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the DAS Bates and ENT consensus guidelines for management of hematoma after thyroid surgery. So I've got no or no conflicts of interest to declare, and this is the paper I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, it was published back in 2021 online and 2022, January 2022 in print. The question is why? Why did we write the guideline? Um, and this um, learning from deaths report from Oxford was one of the huge drivers actually behind this guideline and as with everything for something to change something had to go wrong. I know we've had two case presentations this morning but I'm going to give you a third one very quickly um, and this is a case from Oxford about a 50 year old lady who presented with an indeterminate breast lump um, that needed excision and it was incidentally noted in her in her workup for her surgery that she had a multinodular goiter and it was re recommended that it be removed before she had her breast surgery. So she was expedited um, for a joint op um, in view of her breast lesion status. Um, so her surgery was relatively standard, according to her surgeons. Um, it was a large toxic, toxic goiter. The surgery was long. It took about two and a half hours. Um, and she had an estimated blood loss of about one and a half litres when on average you'd only generally or one and a half um, mils when one half liters when usually you'd only have about 20 to 100 mils um she was discharged to the ward to ward based care late that evening um and at one o'clock the patient alerted staff about some swelling she didn't she had her obs done about 15 minutes before was absolutely fine um and she rapidly deteriorated to the point that she actually pressed her own arrest uh, or her own arrest button on the wall um, in the four bedded area that she was in. The arrest team um, came, she ended up having a respiratory arrest, um, which developed into PEA rhythm. Um, they got Rosk with CPR. Um, there were multiple repeated attempts to intubate her, which were unsuccessful. Um, and surgeon arrived about 15 mi minutes later, um, opened the neck hematoma, and then she was successfully intubated. Um, she returned to theater for a washout, um, had a trachea, um, but it was noted when she went to ITU um, that she was not appropriate on sedation holds. Um, she had a CT head which showed a diffuse severe hypoxic brain injury. Um, she went for neuro rehab and sadly died seven months later with no evidence of any recovery. So there was a coroner inquiry um, which found multiple levels of system failings and deemed this to be a possibly preventable death um, and made recommend recommendations around improved patient safety protocols improved awareness of post-op bleeding, improved understanding of how to manage it, and formalisation of the learnings from the case. And this case first came to my attention um, back in, um, in Belfast in 2018 when it was presented at the BATS meeting where I attended as an F2. And the physiology at a glance um, is that hematoma can develop where pressure builds up. The trachea is very rarely obstructed. It can be deviated, which can cause anaesthetic concerns. But it's the pressure in the venous system, the impaired venous return from the head and the laryngeal edema that generally cause us problems as anaesthetists. Um, you can then end up with a neuronal response, um, respiratory centres switch off in animal studies, that's been shown, and that's that can then lead to hypoxic cardiac arrest. And the best example that um, we found of giving it is a bit like a tourniquet effect. When the hematoma builds up in the deep tissues, it's like putting a tourniquet on. Um, so until you release that tourniquet, you will continue to have worsening laryngeal edema. Um, whereas at least if you release the tourniquet, you should hopefully plateau that edema and maximise your chance of success with an intubation attempt. Um, so like I said, these are the guidelines I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, they're a bit different from other guidelines that DAS have written um, in that they are very much multidisciplinary consensus guidelines. Um, and we did that because we felt that the greatest impact of these guidelines was getting into the middle of the Venn diagram. We needed to make sure that what we produced um, could support the learning and the knowledge of both of all the ward staff, the anaesthetists and the surgeons in order to be effective. And this was our fantastic multidisciplinary team. We had a range of anaesthetists, surgeons, trainees, consultants, nursing and patient representatives. Um, with representatives from DAS Bates and ENT UK. Methods I'm going to speak very briefly about because 
for 99% of the population, they're really boring. Um, but I think it is important just to touch upon it in terms of the rigour of development. So the guidelines were developed according to the Agree 2.0 reporting checklist, which is the best practice for appraisal of guidelines and development of guidelines. Um, they were aimed to be objective. So we did a systematic review to inform um, the guidelines that were put forward. There's a mass sparsity of evidence out there. Cases aren't reported. Um, there's no large studies really. So a lot of the guidelines are based on um, expert opinion, um, but we tried to be objective wherever possible um, and experience. So what we did was we did a three round Delphi study um, in order to make our recommendations. Um, and then we also did a survey, not just of the working group, but also of the DAS Bates and ENT committee on the recommended contents of the post thyroid surgery emergency box. And then we qualified all of our recommendations based on the strength of the supporting evidence. So when you read the text, you'll see all the recommendations are graded A through D, um, with A being consistently consistent systematic reviews of RCTs and D being expert opinion. Um, and we've got a range. Um, a lot of our, uh, there are a lot of our recommendations that are grade D recommendations, but hopefully when we review the guidelines in a few years time, there'll be more evidence out there to support the recommendations that are then made as, they, as they're reviewed. And this is how we came up with our recommendations. And the recommendations have been made across 11 different domains, um, monitoring, recognition, post thyroid surgery, emergency box, management of suspected hematoma after thyroid surgery, cognitive aids, post hematoma evacuation care, day case surgery, training, communication. And there's eight key recommendations. Um, so the first one is that all staff potentially interacting with patients undergoing thyroid surgery should be trained to recognise hematoma. And this includes ward staff where the patients are nursed and doctors of all grades and speciality. Um, these patients can go off at any time. Sorry, my slides keep like jumping forwards on me. Um, so I'm just going to jump back quickly. Um, the includes all the staff where the patients are nursed and the doc and doctors of all grades and speciality. Um, it's recognised that if this happens at two o'clock in the morning in a district general hospital, there might not be a senior surgeon or a senior anaesthetist on site. Um, it could be that you've got an SHO and a CT1 um, anaesthetic trainee covering. Um, we all need to know how to deal with it. Um, it's a surgical problem, um, surgical post-op problem until there's an airway problem. And then all of a sudden it's an anaesthetic problem. So it's all of our problem. Um, and we need to safeguard our patients and do the best by them by making sure that everybody is aware and everybody is trained. Um, we've come up with the post thyroid surgery sur regular review um, and the DSATS alg algorithm. Um, so you're closely monitoring for any of the DSATS signs. So difficulty swallowing, um, change in news, swelling, anxiety, tachypnea, stridor, and any one of those six things um, should trigger an early review. Um, it's in any one of them. And actually, even if the staff just aren't quite happy, um, that's enough to trigger a, a senior clinical review. These patients can go off really, really quickly, as you guys have seen. Um, so we've developed that and that then triggers into the management guideline. Uh, we have recommended that post thyroid surgery emergency boxes should be available at the bedside of patients that have undergone thyroid surgery during the postoperative period, including during transfers. Um, don't want to, don't, you don't want to see someone go off in the lift um, that stops on six floors and not actually have something um, on you that means that you can open the neck. Um, emergency front of neck airway equipment must be readily available on wards caring um, for patients after thyroid surgery. In the same way we've got our packs in theatres and we've got things set up in theatres, um, we felt it was really important that front of neck equipment was there because if you've got a difficult intubation realistically you're going to we're not thinking that an LMA is going to be a strong enough bridge or that you're going to manage with rescue face mask ventilation. If you're concerned, immediately get a senior surgical review. Um, if senior surgical review isn't available or there's any signs of error compromise, a senior anaesthetist should be informed immediately. And, and this, isn't, this isn't a courtesy call. This is someone who's going to see the patient. Um, it may not be that there's an airway compromise or an airway problem now, but there's a very real chance that there could be shortly um, or that they might need to go back to theatre. Um, if it's overnight, if there's other people, if there's not very many people around, you can manage it as a team. Um, and we, then that brings on to recommendation six, which is about 
If they show signs of airway compromise, a systematic approach should be taken to opening the, the neck at the bedside. And this is the scoop approach, which is skin, cutting the sutures, opening the skin, opening the muscles, packing the wound. And then it's a 30 second potentially life saving intervention. Um, and it will make your life as an anaesthetist easier because by opening the neck, it should hopefully mean that your intubation conditions are optimised. I'm going to share a video with you, which has been made by the team in Oxford and shows how quickly you can open the neck. This is a real time video on a real patient. They did it at the end of the surgery with the patient's permission to film. So cutting the superficial sutures, pulling the superficial platysma and the skin open, but then cutting the midline suture to make sure the straps are also open, right down to visualise the trachea. And then just placing a pack over the top of it. And that's a really, really good video that they've made um, and it's been very, very popular amongst lots of the surgical community for sharing. Um, so that then leads on to the actual management algorithm, which we've broken down into three steps initiated by nursing staff. Whoever is present at the beginning is oxygenate and evaluate um, simultaneously while you're evaluating to oxygenate with 15 litres of oxygen, nursing the patient slightly head up, calling for immediate review. Um, and increasing your frequency of OBS. The key question at this point is, are there any signs of airway compromise? If there's not, you've probably got a bit of time to get that help and to get someone else there. If there is signs of airway compromise, that call for help and you need to move on and evacuate the hematoma or the likelihood is that your situation is going to deteriorate prevent, potentially very, very quickly. Part two of the algorithm is to evacuate the hematoma and then part three is to intubate and that's as per the DAS tracheal intubation guidelines. Um, should only be done by an anaesthetist, should only be done by a skilled practitioner. It's not for the nursing staff or someone else to attempt on the ward. But actually knowing that that's coming in the algorithm and sharing the same algorithm means they know that that's coming next. And it was one of the things that our nursing, our nursing member of the group said was really important because they know they need to get somebody there who can intubate the patient. And then when hematoma evacuation is taking place, it's really important that the surgical team, usually the consultant, communicate with the patient, including after discharge, um, including offering referral for psychological support or similar. And this is actually seems quite evident, particularly in the first case that was presented from your trust this morning, um, where it does look like the patient's got some kind of ongoing PTSD and actually would benefit. Finally, in terms of the top eight recommendations, we recommended that all organisations support staff members and members of the multidisciplinary team, including but not exclusive to anaesthetists, nursing staff, members of the cardiac arrest team and surgeons to attain and maintain competencies and skills required to manage complications. This is really, really important in terms of patient safety. And we hope that these we hoped that these guidelines would provide a, a platform for people to have that discussion with their organisations. Um, and with their departments to support, to have that support. We also produced a, an appendix, um, which is Appendix S3 um, in the paper, which includes some supporting resources for implementing the guidance. It's got some SIM scenarios, some easy audit sheets and links to the videos. And the key in it was sharing the message. There's no point in writing the guidelines if you're not going to share them with anybody. And that's partly why I'm delighted to be joining you this morning. Um, we've been very fortunate. Anesthesia have obviously shared them in the journal, but also online. Um, they made us some great infographics. All of the, the Association of Anaesthetists, ENT UK, DAS, Bates, the Royal College have all supported dissemination of the information and the Royal College also supported us putting on this webinar. Um, so the webinar, is, the recording is available on the Royal College of Anaesthetists website um, for anyone who's interested. That's got members of the surgical, um, a number of members of the authorship, but um, members from ENT UK, um, our patient rep, our nursing rep, um, all present at that webinar. Um, it's been fantastic to see on social media, lots of people sharing the message, sharing what they're doing, sharing their thyroid boxes, sharing their teaching. Um, it keeps the conversation going, it increases awareness. Um, these cases do happen and very sadly, there is not always a good outcome. And as an anaesthetic community, I think we can really push to improve outcomes 
by sharing practice and sharing good practice. We've presented the guidelines now at the DAS Bates and ENT UK annual scientific meetings last year. And we've also presented at a nursing, the Anaesthetic Nursing Recovering Association's um, annual meeting and at the British Thyroid Foundation have done something with their patient newsletter. So the patients are also aware. A uh, couple of acknowledgements for me, the most important one obviously goes to all of the members of the working group, DAS Bates and the NT UK committees for all of their support, but actually mostly to everyone who's taken the guidelines, shared the key messages and looked to implement changes as a result um, in the benefits of patient safety. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to make a shameless plug for all of your presenters this morning to look at um, submitting their cases to the DAS ASM um, in October. I think it would be great to see and share your experiences and your learning. Um, like I said, there is a sparsity of evidence out there and actually the more we can share and the more we can keep the conversation going, hopefully the better care we can provide for our patients. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.